This time it's five motorcycles with inline V twin engines. It's become fashionable amongst a lot of journalists these days to describe these bikes as transverse V-twins. I don't know why they do this, haven't they just assumed because the cylinders stick out the side and they know bugger all about motorcycles, because they're journos, that they're in some way transverse engines. But of course, the crankshafts of these bikes, just like on a BMW Boxer, or a Ford Mustang for that matter, the original one, lines in line with the line of the frame or the chassis. This makes them inline engines. So if you call them transverse V-twins, stop it. Stop it now. So with that out of the way, here are five classic companies that made motorcycles with inline V-twin engines. The Victoria V35 Bergmaster. Victoria was a German motorcycle manufacturer and bicycle manufacturer for that matter that was founded in Nuremberg, Germany in 1901 and they would remain in production until 1966. During its lifetime the company made a range of both two and four stroke machines with single and multiple cylinders but they're probably best known for their 1950s Bergmaster. The Bergmaster was first introduced in 1953. They used a 350cc overhead valve V-twin engine, which produced around 21 horsepower, which was powered through a shaft to the back wheel. The engine had very curvaceous designs, fairly typical of the day. The carburetor was hidden under a cowling, tucked in just behind the centrally mounted single camshaft, just as would later be used on motor Gutsy. But unlike Gutsy, the Bergman used a 64 degree V-twin engine rather than the 90 more classically used. Compression ratio was fairly typical for the period, fairly low at 7.5 to 1. This is because the fuel of the time was very poor quality. The engine ran a 64 by 54 bore and stroke. This was done to try and maximise the mid-range torque of the engine, this being quite a small V-twin after all. Overall weight was 177 kilos, and top speed was claimed at 130 kilometres an hour, or around 80 miles an hour for those people who work in non-metric measurements for speed at least. Both front and back, the drum brakes were of a good size and of decent power, and the suspension setup incorporated rear plunger units and hydraulically damped forks at the front. The four speed gearbox made surprising use of connecting chains and was rather clunky, probably the worst feature of the bike overall. The Bergmaster was famed for its over engineered construction. This meant it was a little heavy but was extremely reliable. On the downside, it was very expensive, and this really did hamper sales. Ultimately, only around a thousand examples would ever be constructed by the company. And the low survival rates mean that the Victoria V35 Bergmaster is one of the rarest motorcycles in the world. P&M Panfet P&M or Feeling and More are best known for their Panther big single models, but in their early days they were very much known as a company of innovators, and this is demonstrated ably by the Panthet. In the mid-twenties, P&M wanted something to run alongside their big singles and wanted a lightweight, so they bought in the Mercurial Granville Bradshaw to design something a little bit different. And Bradshaw, who had earlier designed the Boxer Twin ABC, didn't disappoint. This time it was a V-twin in line of a fairly narrow angle with overhead valves but the unusual thing was that the valves were opened and closed by leaf springs rather than coil springs. Also typical Bradshaw, he didn't bother with shaft drive and went straight to chain drive just to make things a bit more complicated. And the complication was the big problem here, the bike was expensive, didn't perform particularly well and wasn't especially reliable. And while the bike looks and sounds amazing, it was a commercial flop taking P&M to the point of bankruptcy. The AJS S3 
Founded in Wolverhampton, ATS was one of the most successful early British motorcycle companies, and the Stevens brothers, during the Great Depression, thought it would be a good idea to try and innovate rather than just cut back and produce cheap machines. And to this end, in 1931, they introduced the S3. This feature was a bit different, it was side valve operation for a start, and the valves were operated by camshafts that ran on the outside of the V rather than down the centre. The machine used aluminium heads, but at just 496cc it wasn't exactly a big performer, and problematically was expensive to build. In fact, AGS's own conventional V-Twin 1000 was cheaper to buy. With its high quality finish and tank top dash, the 50 degree V-Twin was seen very much as a luxury cruiser model, but its high cost contributed to an absolute fails disaster, and one that AGS could ill afford. And by the end of 1931, the company had gone bankrupt, selling out to Matchless, who would later use the name to form the AMC Empire. Motoguzzi Motoguzzi was founded in 1921 on the Mandello del Lario, where the factory still remains to this day, and they are without it at the company most synonymous with this particular engine layout, having used the layout from the late 60s right up until the present day. Work on the design had started all the way back in 1957 when Guzzi had first pulled out of Grand Prix racing, but with fairly low funds it took them a long time to finally get the machines in production, just over a decade in fact. Early machines were fairly low performance and quite heavy, however the arrival of Lino Tonti would change that. He designed a completely new frame which was more rigid and lighter than the previous model, and this would lead to models such as the V7, the S7, the Motor Guzzi Le Mans and various other models ever since. In fact even the California Cruiser made use of the same frame as the Le Mans, which is why it was one of the best handling cruisers around in the 1980s. In the late 70s, Tonti would begin development of the smaller block engines. These looked the same but were actually mechanically very different to the larger machines, sharing no components whatsoever. The small blocks were smaller and much lighter than their bigger cousins. They also used heron heads, rather like Motor Marini. Early versions of the small blocks were built at the Innocenti factory and there were some quality control issues. Guzzi would eventually bring all production of the machines in-house and build quality would gradually improve over the years. But the so-called big block engine too would also evolve, beginning as a 700 then a 750, then later the 850 which would form the basis for the Le Mans and first California models, and then on to 1000 and 1100cc models by the end of overhead valve push rod production, with even the engine taken out as big as 1200cc for some later Brever and Sport models. The Le Mans is probably now the most famous of all Motor Guzzi sporty V-twins. What we now call the Mark I came out first and is for many the best looking. The Mark II looked very blocky and quite unusual, a sort of sports tourer. The Mark III however is much more sleek and gets rid of that vaguely car influenced design that was very popular in the early 80s and late 70s. And of course the Mark III would be the last of the 850 Guzzi Le Manses. The later models all using a 1000cc engine and were ultimately far less popular, which of course means they make a very canny buy. But of course while the Le Mans is the machine that everybody covets and ogles today, it should be remembered that it was in fact the California that really kept the company alive. Unlike the other companies in the list, Motor Guzzi continues to produce its V-twins, making them one of the most characterful and individualistic motorcycles available today. The Honda CX500 Honda CX500 was introduced in the late 70s and was clearly designed to take on the likes of BMW and of course Motor Guzzi. Like the Guzzi, the Honda's engine is a V-twin with overhead valves. But it's 80 degrees instead of 90 degrees and it's water cooled, fairly obviously. Other unusual features at the time was the use of four valve heads 
and the fact that the gearbox was actually mounted in the crankcase alongside the crankshaft. And cleverly this was contra-rotating to help limit some of that torque reaction. It also meant that the clutch was mounted at the front of the engine rather than between the gearbox and the engine a la BMW and Motor Gutsy and this made maintenance somewhat easier. But it also meant that access to the generator and slightly more problematically the cam chain and its tensioner was more difficult. And this particular feature would come back and haunt Honda somewhat later on. The unusual transmission setup meant that the engine was somewhat shorter than the engine of say a Motor Guzzi or a BMW. However it was also somewhat more top heavy so the engine doesn't feel quite as nimble or as low down as those other machines. And also with the water cooling it's considerably heavier than its opposition. But the engine power of the 500 and the 650 in particular was very good and the machine will whistle up to over a ton with no problems at all. Often ridiculed at the time, the shaft drive plastic maggot turned into one of the greatest commuter bikes of all time and was an absolute favourite with dispatch riders, famed for its rugged reliability. And today, rather like the Honda Cub, the CX is seen as something of an 80s icon and is a very popular classic machine. One of the collections of machines would you like to see us do a video on? Maybe you've got a motorcycle we can use for a test ride. Either way, get in touch. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.